So I had recently done a video on the rise and fall of the Canadian compilation album Big Shiny Tunes. One of the bands I mentioned was the Canadian American group Big Rack. A few of you said, why don't you do a story on Big Rack? They would be featured on Big Shiny Tunes 1 and 3, and I hear their music every now and then on the radio. And their sound is really a melting pot of so many different styles as the original lineup were classically trained musicians. The band, funny enough, got their big break attempting to smuggle their singer across the border into the United States, and they owed a bit of their success to the Canadian heavyweight group The Tragically Hip, or rather their management company, and the band's frontman could have become the singer for one of the most popular supergroups of the 2000s, only to be turned down because he refused to do one thing. In today's video, let's talk about the history of the group Big Rack, a band that one reviewer referred to as playing bowel-shaking guitar chords. I've never heard a band described that way. Big Rack's origins dated back to 1992 at the prestigious Berklee College of Music. Four students who were strangers to one another would eventually meet and form the band Big Rack. The group would be made up of Canadian guitarist and vocalist Ian Thornley, guitarist Brian Doherty, bassist Dave Henning, and drummer Forrest Williams. Thornley would grow up in Toronto and his parents were heavily into folk music and the blues. Thornley credits his parents' musical taste for him gravitating really heavily towards melodies early on in his life. He would admit to the Boston Globe that he first enjoyed Led Zeppelin's folkier stuff, telling the paper, their screaming didn't appeal to me until later. The Zeppelin record that really got him into hard rock was Led Zeppelin 3, adding to the Ottawa Citizen. That was their folky, soft-sounding album, but there were a real couple rockin' tunes on it. I started to see why people were loving it. Thornley soon got into the harmonies of groups like Supertramp and also got heavily into southern rock bands like Leonard Skinner. Thornley started playing piano at the age of nine and even studied classical music. He would play in a Toronto-based band called Tula, which played 80s pop in nightclubs around the city, but he briefly left music to pursue basketball and do just normal teenage stuff. It was following high school in 1992, he headed south across the border to attend the prestigious Berklee College of Music to study arrangement and technique. Doherty and Henning, meanwhile, were from New York, while Williams was from Massachusetts. So one Canadian, three Americans. According to Guitar Player Magazine, Thornley apparently set the record for the most noise infractions at the school, and he would be shipped from dorm to dorm, and it soon resulted in him meeting his future bandmates. Thornley would tell the Boston Globe that the quartet focused more on groove than technical chops, telling the paper, it wasn't like skipping class was a big deal. If you got into a jam at 10 at night and it happened to go six or seven in the morning, that was more important than going to a ranging class. Doherty, meanwhile, would tell the Ottawa Citizen, the biggest thing I got out of Berkeley was being exposed to an atmosphere that encourages you to play all the time to jam and practice. The members would end up dropping out of the school, becoming full-time working musicians in their outfit they referred to as Big Rack. It's not entirely clear where the band's name came from. One interview had Doherty coming up with the name, telling an interviewer, we were just desperate for a name at one point. We were coming out with our first demo, and we were going with another name that was worse. Their first name saw them actually play under the moniker Still Waters, according to the Edmonton Journal. Some of those early gigs were pretty rough. Thornley would tell the journal, I couldn't sing at all then. I've heard some tapes, and they're really bad. I had to accept the singer guy role, which I only recently did. The band's sound throughout their career was really hard to categorize, largely because their influences were so wide-ranging. So in addition to Thornley's influences I mentioned earlier, Doherty's influences included metal, while Henning's were jazz and classical, while Williams enjoyed Supertramp. Big Wreck would frequently be labeled as post-grunge, proto-progressive, progressive, and see comparisons to the likes of Soundgarden, The Who, Collective Soul, Simple Minds, Robert Johnson, and the Canadian group Big Sugar. The group's early shows were pretty rough. There were hundreds of forgettable gigs, some of which saw them play to a handful of people while trying to sell their tapes to anyone who would buy them. Couple this with numerous record label rejections, and things really didn't seem to be looking up for the group. The band would spend nearly three years on the road, touring across Canada and the eastern US, but the experience gave them a blueprint for their first album. However, it seemed apparent to them that Boston wasn't exactly embracing them with open arms. The band soon temporarily relocated to Canada in 1995 for a period of about six months. Big Wreck finally caught their first big break the same year when they tried to cross the border back into the United States and border security guards discovered that Thornley's visa had expired. 
drummer Forrest Williams would tell an interviewer, my van got taken away and I had to write an essay to the US Marshal explaining how wrong I was for trying to get him into the country. During his time stuck in Toronto, Thornley would shop around the group's demo tape and he actually got some interest from a company called Management Trust that just happened to manage Canadian rock royalty, the Tragically Hip. The company signed the group and landed them a lot more gigs and pushed them to record a new demo tape that they could shop to labels. Their new demo would include the songs The Oaf, That Song, and Blown Wide Open. Just a side note guys, The Oaf was actually a loving name that the members gave to their drummer. Big Rex soon nabbed a recording deal with Atlantic in the States, and Atlantic at the time were known for being a nurturing kind of label, as the talent they had included Matchbox 20 and Jewel, who took almost a year to break big. Big Rec would release their debut record in 1997, titled The Loving Memory Of, which would be produced by Joseph Puig, whose credits included L7, Tonic, and The Verve Pipe. And the lyrics would be written by Thornley, who took inspiration from real life events and relationships in his life, hence the title In Loving Memory Of. Big Rec was convinced that the single That Song would be their breakout hit, but it would be the track The Oaf, which was cobbled together in a short jam session that was the biggest hit off the record. That song still did pretty well in both Canada and the States though. The band soon landed themselves on the MTV program 120 Minutes, and at one point The Oaf was the most added song to rock radio playlists. Big Rec's first major tour would see them play alongside Dream Theater, and they'd also be part of the old Canadian rock festival Edge Fest. In Loving Memory Of would sell around 250,000 copies in Canada being certified double platinum, but across the border it was a different story. The album didn't even crack the Billboard 200 chart and didn't even go gold. The members were soon perplexed at the album's performance in America, and this is a similarity they shared with the Tragically Hip. Both bands had a lot of success in Canada, but couldn't make huge inroads south of the border. Big Rex's debut record sold double the number of copies in Canada as it did in the States, at least according to the Calgary Herald, and its Canadian shows were more heavily attended than even their own shows that they did in their hometown of Boston. Thornley would tell the Calgary Herald the difference in playing Canadian dates compared to Boston admitting, if we play with an opening band in Toronto, they're coming off and we tell them they had a good set. They come off and they're like, the dude from Big Rex said we rock. In Boston you do the same thing and they're like, so? Apparently your opinion matters more depending on the number of albums you've sold. Big Rec with their wide ranging musical influences were amazed that so many bands at the time were able to coast on the coattails of others. Thornley would sometimes come off as being overconfident or brash, telling the Edmonton Journal, you can call me an arrogant guy and a cocky guy or an egomaniac, I don't really look at it that way. I have a code I live by and there happens to be a lot of crap out there that just doesn't cut it with me. I can't believe we're still in the grunge thing. I can't believe people are still ripping off Eddie Vedder and making a lot of money. Why don't you find out where Eddie Vedder got his thing from? Big Rec would return in June of 2001 with their long-awaited second album, The Pleasure and the Greed. It was ahead of the record's release. The band talked about experimenting with some new sounds, but also being aware that Atlantic, their label, wanted some radio singles. Thornley would admit at the time, I have a million classic rock ripoff things. We'll probably have to throw in a couple of those on the next record. The group's second album would come together after two years on the road writing material on buses, at sound checks, or in hotel rooms. Alterbridge frontman Miles Kennedy would actually sing background vocals on the song Breakthrough. For the first time though, the band enjoyed the luxuries of an expensive recording studio, resulting in a 60 minute plus record. Thornley would come into the sessions with about 60 to 100 song ideas that were eventually narrowed down to 16 tracks. Producer David Jordan, who'd previously worked with Alice in Chains and Jane's Addiction, would produce the record. The band also got a little experimental for their tour for the second record, doing a few shows, one in Edmonton and one in Toronto with a symphony orchestra, in addition to some guest appearances, including the members of the Tragically Hip and Colin James. But four years had passed between records and the musical landscape had changed. Record labels had undergone massive changes, including mergers and layoffs, and internet piracy was a new major problem. Big Rack would soon sing a different tune about writing commercial hits, with Doherty telling the Saskatoon publication, I suppose the risks are not getting airplay and not sounding poppy and not sounding like everyone else. We're just not interested in writing commercial material. Doherty in a different interview would tell a Waterloo paper that his theory was that rock music was fizzling across the border, adding, there's just not a lot of room for music down there. MTV just has people sticking their asses and crotches in the camera to sell records. But in 2002, Big Rec would break up. 
Thornley would talk a bit about the breakup telling an interviewer, we lost sight of the reasons why we started doing it in the first place. I had grown disillusioned with the whole thing, just the pressures that had been thrown on us, the pressures that we dealt with badly. Couple this with alcohol and partying, as well as issues with their record label and their management, and the band members needed some time apart. But despite the issues that the band was dealing with following the release of their second album, it still held a special place for Thornley who told an interviewer, I love that record. Every time I go back to it, I'm still impressed with it. But maybe there's too many songs, too many notes. There's a lot of music on there and I guess people didn't want to carve out an hour and a half from their day just to listen to the record. He would add that it's not the type of record you just have playing in the background while you're doing something else. It requires a lot of attention. Thornley would end up releasing two solo albums Thornley also nearly joined the supergroup Velvet Revolver, who fired Scott Weiland in 2008. Thornley would reveal he auditioned for the group, recorded vocals for some songs, and even jammed with them in LA. But there was one issue. He wanted to sing and play guitar at the same time, but Velvet Revolver already had two guitar players, so things didn't ultimately work out. Fast forward to 2010, and Big Wreck would reunite, at least half the lineup would. The new lineup would consist of Thornley, Doherty, and the musicians who played in Thornley's solo band. Their first tour back would be billed as Ian Thornley and Big Wreck, and they would do a series of reunion shows across Canada and also include material from Thornley's solo work. What spurred the reunion was that Doherty would marry a Canadian woman and move to Canada living in Sarnia, while the other two ex members moved back to the States. The reunion happened because Doherty and Thornley kept in touch usually speaking to one another during the holidays. Then one day, Thornley's guitarist couldn't make some of the solo shows. He had gotten married and was going on his honeymoon, and he had suggested that Doherty fill in for him, and he did. The pair soon rekindled their friendship, and Doherty even joined Thornley in the studio for a new album that was supposed to be his third solo record, but it eventually morphed into the new Big Wreck album. Thornley would tell the Kingston Wig Standard that the other two original members didn't participate in the reunion due to what he referred to as logistical reasons. Thornley would add he still talks with Henning regularly, but not so much their drummer Williams. The band would return in 2012 with their third record, Albatross, which would be their final album to go gold in Canada. The title track would top the Canadian rock charts for almost two months, giving the band their first number one song of their career, and it also charted in America. The band has put out four more full-length studio albums since 2014 and numerous EPs, with two of them coming just last year. Then in 2019, it was announced that Big Wreck co-founder and guitarist Brian Doherty had passed away after a prolonged battle with lung cancer. He was just 51 years old. The band would dedicate their tour at the time to their departed guitarist. Big Wreck toured last year in 2023, but they haven't announced anything yet for 2024. That concludes today's video guys. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. If, as always, if you have suggestions for future topics, use the link in the description box below. We'll see you again. Rock and roll your stories. Take care.